my pleasure to introduce Gunn Sire, who I know from Cornell. He's a renowned Cornell computer science faculty member who is now on leave from the university so that he can run a company that he started called Ava Labs. So I like to say, get ready for a little confusion as we dive into the digital asset universe. I'm still getting my, my head around this. Uh, Scott, once again, will be our moderator. Uh, welcome, Gunn, and thank you, Scott. And I will jump off and pop back in with questions as they come up. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks, Zach. Feel free to do so. Hi, Gunn. How are you? Very good. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course. Thanks for joining us today. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to have to do a context switch here from food uh, issues in Africa uh, uh, to uh, another sort of side of a spectrum of entrepreneurship at the very bleeding edge of um, digital digital. Uh, blockchain and currencies and, 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 uh, and, and maybe you could, uh, well, I guess maybe we could back up a little bit. I, I know that you were uh, born in Turkey and you went to high school there. I believe you came to uh, the US uh, at first to go for, you know, to college at Princeton. Uh, maybe you could just give us a little sense of your path and, uh, and how you found yourself at Cornell. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, fairly straightforward. I grew up in Istanbul, um, went to a government uh, primary school at a very funny time, uh, you know, with uh, 55 kids in the room. Special education hadn't been invented yet. It was a mix of kids. Um, somehow from there, I got into a very, very good high school. Uh, it's the very first American high school overseas, actually, the first international American high school. And uh, that prepared me. That taught me English. That's where I learned. And um, then we all had to take this exam to get into Turkish universities, and it was very, very difficult. And I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to go to Princeton, and I was like, well, it's a lot easier to go overseas than to, uh, than to take this very, very difficult exam. So, uh, so then I found myself over here. I, I, I did my four years of undergrad. I was very hungry to learn more, and I thought, hey, if I go into a PhD program, they pay my way. And I'll find out, you know, maybe I'll leave with a master's, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, so I got my doctorate. I uh, always had a, had a deep desire to build really large, complex systems that work, that have a life of their own. So uh, I got my doctorate in 2000 uh, or around then. Well, I, I left, I finished the program around then. The, the thesis issue was a little afterwards. Uh, but I came to Cornell in 2001 and um, I ended up... Uh, uh, you know, developing a, a program on distributed systems. And I ended up building a fair number of peer-to-peer -peer systems. And um, I was one of the early people who worked on uh, digital currencies. I built something called Karma and uh, it had proof of work mining in it. So it had one of the key features of Bitcoin in it in 2001, uh, many years before Satoshi. And um, those years were the years after 9-11. The country was very worried about terrorist financing. So I was counseled by my mentors to not really stay in that area. It was going to be a tough area to find funding in. So, uh, so I left the area and then Satoshi Nakamoto came along, invented Bitcoin in 2009, showed the world what one could do. And I got back into cryptocurrencies and I found problems with uh, what Satoshi invented. We invented new things that are better, faster, more decentralized, more scalable. And, um, and at the end of that journey, about, a year, about two years ago, I started this company called Ava Labs. And uh, we built a brand new blockchain that's much faster than everyone else, much more decentralized than everyone else is. So, uh, so here we are. Uh, we just did our launch six weeks ago. Uh, we did a series of successful fundraisers. Uh, we have about $1.3 billion worth of a network built up uh, with the, uh, the Avalanche uh, system. And uh, we're hoping to build on top of that now. So we'll, so, and we'll get to that. I mean, I guess any, any good interviewer of someone who uh, was early in the world of crypto should probably ask you point blank, Gun, are you Satoshi? Uh, no, I've been asked this. I've been accused of being Satoshi. Um, I've also gotten death threats and so forth. When I found problems with Satoshi's work, people really hated me for a while. Uh, but no, I'm not Satoshi. Um, when, I've when accused when, of, I've also, Scott, yeah. I've been also accused of uh, being various different hackers. So uh, there are a bunch of hacks and I was involved in some of them, in, the, in, in remedying some of them. And so I've been accused of being the DAO hacker in Ethereum. I'm also not the DAO hacker. Um, I, I even thought like some people actually reported me to the police for this. Anyway, it was, uh, I got a call from the FBI and I thought, are they calling me to 
tap into my expertise or am I a, an interesting person to them or am I a person of interest to them? Right. We have this conversation. <laughs> so. Hopefully the whole Cornell professor thing is uh, either it's a, a brilliant cover or it's uh, some way that mitigates <laughs> people's concerns about your tactics. Um, Wow. I mean, it's just, it's really uh, just an amazing field. And I know you were tinkering, um, you know, in the very early days. I mean, maybe before we go into, um, to, it's Ava is the pronunciation, correct? Right. Yeah, that's how I say it. Okay. Yeah. So before we get in there, I mean, maybe you could just help us with your outlook. Like what is, you know, what is the world going to look like, you know, years from now as mainstream ad adoption of blockchain driven services take off. I mean, I know there, you know, of course, like file ca file coin came about, which is a, a essentially a decentralized a competitor to AWS and Google cloud. And, you know, there's so many disruptive technologies on the horizon. Um, and of course, Bitcoin, I mean, Bitcoin's at a, you know, near, a, not an all time high, but certainly like trading at among its highest prices um, in terms of holding its, you know, holding that stability at a high price. And I think we're at a record in, in, in a number of ways there. Like what's, what, what do you think the world's gonna look like? Yeah, it's a great question. So we're living through a very, very formative life, uh, formative time in, uh, in the evolution of financial technologies. So for about, I would say 50 years or so, there are many aspects of finance that got ossified, that hasn't really evolved much. If you think about your relationship to your bank and how it has changed since 1955, since credit scores were invented, it really hasn't changed much at all. If you think about the services they offer, you know, they're pretty basic and they haven't changed much at all. And um, so my vision is that in about 10 years or so, we're going to see a complete revamping of the, uh, the foundations of financial technologies. Every single back office will be connected to multiple blockchains. Assets will be digital. We're going to evolve from a world where assets are on paper or they have vertically uh, integrated and highly, uh, uh, highly guarded by gatekeepers uh, kind, of, uh, kind of ecosystems. And we will find open platforms for the trade of uh, creation and trade of assets. That's where we're headed. And uh, it's unstoppable because these technologies by their very nature cannot be censored, cannot be controlled easily. And the trend is very obvious now that we're about 10 and a half years into this re revolution. And let me pile on to that. So if it were just that, if it were just a process of taking assets as we know them and making them digital, opening them up and giving them a wider reach so that somebody in Singapore can invest in American assets or vice versa. If it were just that, then it wouldn't really impact our lives all that much, actually. It would be a geeky transformation of people like me changing the back offices of a bunch of companies, but it wouldn't really impact every, every person on earth. I believe the area will impact everybody on earth because it will disintermediate the gatekeepers. And it will allow many other people to come in, push aside the incumbents, and create new startups that genuinely bring value uh, in, into financial transactions. So it's, a, it's an extinction level event for many incumbents and a huge opportunity for startups to come. That actually is great context um, for my next question. I mean, you're, you, know, you took this leave of absence from Cornell, which I think I'm also going to ask a question about because that's an interesting move. And um, and uh, and you started a company. You started Ava Labs. So what what exactly does Ava do? Help us understand. Sure. Um, at the very core of it, we are building blockchain technologies. What that really means is we have built a platform, the uh, the Avalanche platform, uh, whose job is to help other people create digital assets. Uh, specifically, the platform prides itself on being very fast and being very flexible to the point of being able to accommodate legal requirements naturally. It also, and the third and final thing about this platform is that it's open or amenable at least to governance. So if you, should you want your asset to have dynamically changing properties, you can actually build it into our platform very easily. This trifecta is hard to find in blockchains right now. And by fast, I don't mean just a little bit fast, I think a lot of people have heard of Bitcoin. Some people have heard of blockchains. Uh, the tech savvy people kind of go like, well, yeah, I've heard of them. I played with them. These things are very, very slow. Uh, the Avalanche platform is many orders of magnitude faster 
than everything that came before it. So that's a qualitative change at that point. It's not just quantitative. It's, it's very, very different to interact with a, a chain that can make thousands of transactions per second or a chain that is faster than Visa compared to say Bitcoin, which is about one one thousandth the speed of Visa. Very big difference. So, um, so that's, uh, that's the platform. And, uh, but it's, we're not limited to that. We're also building additional services on top. We help enterprises digitize their assets. We help people build uh, business workflows using smart contracts. These are essentially programs that cannot misbehave, programs that provide uh, ultimate uh, auditability, ultimate transparency to end users. So for those people who don't know what a smart contract is, think of it as an Excel spreadsheet that is capable of sending money according to a pre-programmed formula. So if you wanted to run a charity, for example, and you were to do it on a smart contract, you would, you would obviate the need to audit because by construction, the smart contract would, would be managing your money flows and everything that happens would be amenable to, would be transparent to everybody. Everyone in real time could see how the money is being routed. So that's my simplest example. There are many much, much fancier, much more exciting examples as well, of course. But, uh, but we build uh, smart contract solutions and digital asset solutions. Got it. And so I'm trying to think of the, uh, the types of transactions that are currently done the antiquated way that will you know, certainly migrate as well as maybe new types of transactions that aren't even necessarily popular or even possible now that you know, will, will be powered you know, by, um, by ultimately by digital assets you know, on top of the Ava platform. Are there any like, you know, interesting, practical, everyday examples you could give us of what we might expect? Sure, Actually, many, to, many. If you will, if you will oh, let me. Go ahead, Zach. Zach. Uh, how, I want to hear the, oh, Go ahead. You know, I was going to say, like, how about voting? <laughs> no, you don't want to do voting. Yes, I was the advisor to, to a, blockchain, a, a, a blockchain voting company. Um, there is a lot of pushback on the voting side. It's a little dangerous. I personally, as a techie, believe that it's time has come and we could do voting on a blockchain very, very easily. It's a very fascinating topic. Uh, but there are a, a range of... Uh, well, there are two things. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the orthodoxy is very much against electronic voting measures where the machines are not controlled by, by some state agent. So voting from your cell phone using, the, using a blockchain seems really compelling to me, especially with COVID, especially with the lockdown. But uh, there, are, there is enough resistance and some of the arguments actually hold water. Um, so it will happen ultimately, but I think it's about 20 years away as opposed to being right here right now. But Scott, let me give you a, a gradation of, of examples, if you will. So the simplest one is money. Um, I think everybody who is an international student or has an international side to their lives knows how difficult it is to send money around. So we live in a digital age and we are somehow unable to route money. Like if I had to send money right now uh, in euros as of the second to Italy, it would be actually fairly difficult. I would have to go to an FX uh, broker, I'd have to buy the euros, wire them, etc. cetera. Um, and this is true for remittances, for workers who work in the US want to send money back. Um, sure, they can send it back with the help of Western Union perhaps, they pay about $20 in fees. A typical remittance payment is about 60 to a few hundred dollars. That's a substantial percentage of the amount being sent back. Uh, with, with digital currencies, this can happen very, very quickly. In the case of if you use the Avalanche platform, it happens in, in, in the blink of an eye and with essentially a fraction of a cent for a fee, no matter how much money you're sending. You could send a billion dollars across the globe for a fraction of a cent in under a second. So that's a huge step up from currencies as we know them. There is no intermediary involved. I can just send it to whoever I'm sending it to. That's one. Uh, let me give you a second example. It's, these are all prosaic, boring examples, but let me just kind of throw them out there just to, to underline the importance of these technologies. Take equities trading. You would think, you know, I'm, I'm looking at Wall Street right now. I'm in Brooklyn at the moment. You would think that this tech, tech is very well established. You would think that, hey, 
if anything, the finance area has this covered. There are so many intermediaries. They're so regulated, so well audited that they must be doing everything right. Well, about, um, I think it was about six or seven years ago, there was the scandal involving the Dole company, the famous banana company. And uh, there was a, it's a long story, I'll make it short. Uh, some, uh, some official requirement forced them to have to count their outstanding shares. The Dole company has issued, had issued at that point 38 million shares. Then they counted all the people who have a claim to a share, who, people who think that they own a share. And it turned out that there were 53 million shares outstanding. So this is a huge disaster. It did not get the airtime that it should have outside of uh, finance circles, but it did happen. In this day and age, we lost track of the number of, uh, of, of stock certificates outstanding. We couldn't do basic arithmetic and uh, the price must have been depressed tremendously because there are all these fake or synthetic or non-backed certificates outstanding out there. Blockchains would have done away with that entirely. But it gets much more exciting when you get into smart contracts. Um, so uh, there are, for example, uh, all sorts of things that you could digitize with the help of a smart contract, all sorts of institutions you could run transparently with the help of uh, smart contracts. So things like domain name registry. So those people who, who buy .com names, um, you know how much you pay for it per year, $12 per year. It's not, it doesn't cost that much to, you know, there's somebody out there uh, they're called the name name server uh, that's actually collecting a huge amount of rent just by virtue of being at the top of that. That entire thing could be could be made to take a fraction of a cent if you were to just put it on a blockchain. Um, there are all sorts of other examples, uh, but income sharing agreements are really exciting ones. Bonds, financial instruments that are sparsely traded, things like debt instruments. Uh, these are very hard to, uh, to, to get into. Suppose you wanted to invest in companies. Sovereign bonds. I was in Ithaca. I tried to buy a uh, Russian bond because the Russians at the time were giving 14% interest. And I remember I went to the bank downtown in Ithaca and they said, you know, you'll have to talk to our investment advisor. I said, okay. They said, well, come back on Thursday. That's when he's here. Come back. And this portly gentleman tells me, Sounds like you want to buy junk bonds and, you know, it's very hard to buy Russian bonds, but maybe I can interest you in GM. And, um, you know, it's like GM is GM and uh, what I wanted to do was invest in a superpower with, with nukes. And um, it was really interesting. So these, uh, these financial assets are beyond our reach as normal people. You have to go through intermediaries and we can just flatten that space and make it open to competition with the help of these new technologies. That's wild. And sorry, my, my camera for some reason is, is, is acting up, but I'm still here. So, um, <laughs> so many possibilities. Uh, so maybe a quick question then just about, uh, so you did a token sale. Maybe you could just help people understand what a token sale is and, um, and you know, and what, the, what it means that tokens, you know, for something that is still in its, early days is, you know, is being publicly traded and what the implication of that is for even your initial investors, just so people understand how that works. Sure. Uh, there are many different kinds of tokens uh, and tokens can serve all sorts of different functions. Um, so the ones that involve me are uh, what we call layer one tokens. So what we are building is called a layer one. It's the foundation of, uh, of a blockchain. Uh, think of it as analogous to the protocols for exchanging packets on the internet. So layer ones are the protocols for recording transactions on these new financial uh, platforms. So um, to, to run these platforms, to provide incentives for people to participate in, in them, to ensure that people do not attack the platform by flooding it with frivolous transactions, uh, to ensure that people with important transactions are prioritized ahead of those people who, are, uh, who have you know, less stringent time needs. Uh, there has to be some kind of a financial value attached to each transaction. And that typically happens in the form of a digital asset uh, that, uh, that one can acquire and uh, trade with the help of digital signatures. So uh, in our case, we have this token called AVAX, A-V-A-X. 
and it is what powers the network. It is uh, the, the, uh, the, the denomination in which you pay your transaction fees. It is the means by which the network knows what's important, what's not. It is the means by which the network rewards you when you participate in the protocol and help re record and keep track of uh, the, uh, the financial history of the system. Uh, there are other kinds of tokens. So um, there are what are called layer two tokens or app tokens. There are tokens that are backed by something. Uh, there are tokens out there where if you hold that digital token in your hand, it corresponds to us a, a regular dollar that you can redeem it for. We call these things stable coins. Uh, there are tokens out there that correspond to diamonds. There are tokens that correspond to gold. Um, there are tokens that correspond to fractionalized real estate. You hold that token, you hold a, a fraction uh, of, uh, of ownership in a large uh, collection of, uh, of real estate and the income stream from that, that, uh, that collection uh, gets distributed uh, pro rata to all of the token holders. So, uh, so there, and, and there's, there's many other token types to come. Oh, there are tokens that represent uh, what we call non-fungible tokens that represent things like uh, trading cards, uh, things that, that have a unique feature uh, associated with them. Every token is different. And uh, they're typically in limited quantities. You can collect these. And if you make a series, then you, know, you, know, you get some goodness or whatever. Um, so they, rep they uh, replace the good old trading cards that we grew up with as kids. Um, so it runs from all of the you know, money applications to finance applications to all kinds of gaming applications. Um, my own token, Avox, is a layer one token. It powers the system. Great. Hey, Scott, I'm going to jump in with a couple of yeah, questions. Yeah, sure, please, Zach. Okay? Yep. Um, so here's one from a student, Gunn. So I think I know the answer already, but I'm going to ask the question. Um, what resources or action steps would you recommend to a Cornell student who has some blockchain experience looking to explore professional opportunities in the space? Uh, fantastic question. Number one, start by connecting with the Cornell Blockchain Club. We are one of the top three clubs in the universe, or at least the globe, uh, on the world, in the world, to, um, uh, to you know, that, that actually changes uh, the game. It's a very active club. Uh, we have had many, I used to be the advisor to the club. Uh, we held some really visible um, conferences and uh, we even opened the NASDAQ. I'm really proud of this. Cornell Blockchain Club was the very first blockchain institution to ring the opening bell at NASDAQ. And it was a, it was a fantastic experience. So start by connecting with your peers. Um, that's I think where you're going to get a lot of networking value. Um, second is read up and, uh, and participate on the educational learning opportunities on campus. And there are many. So uh, there are online courses, there are courses that are being taught, there are at least 10 plus courses uh, this year that are being taught this year on blockchains. Some of them are very technical, some of them are completely non-technical. There are uh, courses in the law school, three different one, ones actually. Uh, there are many courses in the computer science department, and there are other courses in econ and the hotel school and so on. So find the course that you like or find a set of courses that you like. And that's, that's a great uh, area to, to go into. Now, when it comes to finding a job, um, just online sources are fantastic. Everybody's looking right now. This is a very hot area. And um, a typical online job search will yield many, many, many leads for you to get started with. Of course, we're hiring at, at uh, Ava Labs. Um, this, that's a starting point. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, but there are many others as well. And uh, it's a, it's a very vibrant field right now. Great. Let me do one more. So um, thanks so much for your fascinating presentation. Have you been in touch with foreign financial regulators? And how do you convince them that the cloud is safe and that a completely digital system is safe? Great question. So have I been in touch with them? Yes, of course. I have spent so many cycles um, talking to financial regulators, both in the US, the Fed and others, and also overseas in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, so um, I've also spoken to many central banks. And um, so the initial concerns were indeed along security. 
That is, are these blockchains safe? What will happen to my digital asset? Will a, will a Russian hacker take my value away? You know, if I put my home on the, on the blockchain, if the deed is on the blockchain, will I lose it when my machine gets owned by, by somebody? So there are th these kinds of uh, concerns. Uh, there were these kinds of concerns in the early days. Those concerns are very, very valid, uh, even today. But there are two things that have actually helped the scene improve a little bit. One of them is the invention of these uh, secure hardware wallets. There are little devices that hold your keys such that even if somebody comes to own the entirety of your laptop or cell phone, it's still impossible for them to get your digital assets. So these uh, digital wallets like ledgers and trezors and so forth are incredibly useful for keeping your assets safe. So the amount of theft that we see um, from digital assets has gone down tremendously over, over time as a result of that transition. Uh, chains are also providing features by which you can reclaim assets um, after they're stolen if you manage to do the right things and, and, uh, and put them in cold storage properly. So there are remedies both on the chain side and also on, on the personal user side. Um, with the end result being that people are kind of coming to be kind of comfortable with digital assets. And um, we, I haven't had to work hard to convince regulators uh, that this is a, a legitimate technology with uses that's up and coming and so on. Um, maybe seven, eight years ago, you know, sure, um, they were kind of uh, hesitant. But these days, especially in the last year, there was a huge transformation. Premier Xi of China in uh, January of this year, 2020, went up and said, uh, there are a couple of areas that we're going to be focusing on, and one of them are blockchains. So he didn't say Bitcoin or any, any specific one. He said blockchains in general, and that put the fire under every single other uh, central bank. So since that time, I've spoken to many feds, as you know, the fed is not a singular entity, but many different feds inside the US. Um, I've spoken to the Bank of Canada, Bank of England, uh, Bank of Japan, and um, you know, many other central banks about their what we call central bank uh, digital currencies, CBDCs. So many different central banks are looking to issue these things. So not only are the regulators already over that hump, they are just, they're looking at each other left and right. Every time they call me, actually, I say, hey, you know, how's it going? You know, we have a nice friendly banter. I say, you know, I say, you know, I know why you're calling me. And they're like, it's not because of China. <laughs> Immediately, <laughs> before, even before I say it, like, no, I, I, think, I think it's because of China. They're like, no, no, we swear it's not. Then they say, but have you been speaking to the Chinese? Where are they? <laughs> so so they, they badly want to know where all the competitors are. And uh, there is a race right now for all of, the, all of the central banks to do something in this space. And we're going to be seeing these solutions come out. Uh, That's exciting because it's, um, it's, it's sort of one of those, you know, be disrupted or disrupt yourself moments, yeah. right? And, uh, and the, the Fed could have a very little role in, um, in currency and transactions in the future, or they could have a central role, you know, depending on how they play their cards, I guess. Yeah, I think for the U.S. to to maintain for the U.S. dollar to maintain its dominance in a digital age, it has to go digital, yeah. and that digitization has to happen with some official backing. Uh, that official backing hasn't come in, and so we have these stablecoin solutions from third parties. But at some point, I think it will just be so apparent. The need is is going to be so clear that uh, that federal regulators will have to or federal institutions will have to step yeah. in. Yeah. Great. Well, hey, Scott, we're just about out of time, but why don't you hit the last two questions on your sheet because they're pretty simple. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I guess the, the last, I'll, I'll, I'll combine them all into one really, which is just a question around, you know, being, being drawn away from academia to start a company and, um, and was it challenging to, to leave, you know, a traditional post and, and, and get started with something and also, you know, why don't you think that happens more often and what could be improved in the process of, uh, you know, of, uh, of, of, of talent like you, you know, going out and, you know, changing the industry as opposed to just teaching about it. Right. Um, it's, it was not easy at all. Anybody who says this is an easy journey is, is lying to you. It's so hard to build a team, to have an idea, to, um, 
you know, there's going to be technological risk of taking your vision and technically meeting up to uh, the, the, the vision that you, you, you publicly announced. Uh, but there's also a market risk. And market risk often, like everybody will tell you that it's, it's, the, it's the greater source of risk, actually. You could do everything perfectly right and, uh, and still get rejected in the market. So, um, so these are stressful. Um, was it easy? By no means was it easy. Um, but I, I did have some strengths. Um, one of my special magic powers has been my connection to Cornell. And I, I cherish it. Um, the, uh, the brilliant people I have met at Cornell have played an enormous role uh, in staffing the company and working with me and helping the company in other capacities. So I'm grateful to the Cornell community. My company is at least 40%, maybe 50% Cornellians and uh, in, you know, ex alumni of different kinds. So, um, so that's, that's important. Uh, wherever you go, uh, when you are doing something like this, you too will need, a, will need personnel. And you have to have a hinterland you can draw from. And um, uh, so, you know, Stanford's of the world, uh, Berkeley's of the world, you know, that's like right in the heart of Silicon Valley or very close. They've been combed over. Um, and I was lucky about my connection to Cornell. Cornell is not as picked over. Uh, and so I was, I was able to get some amazing, amazing engineers and business development people from Cornell. So that's, that's the biggest challenge, I think, is finding the right people. Um, everything else comes, you know, I mean, it's a lot of sacrifice, but, uh, uh, and if you get, and it's a lot of luck, you got to get the timing right. Um, so uh, was it hard to leave academia? Yeah, and yes and no. Uh, the opportunity was so big. Um, and I do have this belief that, you know, a lot of academics are all about, they, they, they measure what they do by the output, by the paper output, by the tangible thing that they get evaluated on. The length of your CV is a very critical thing. The quality of your publication is a very critical thing as an academic. I didn't really care for much for that. You know, my, my CV got to a certain length where it became, you know, unmanageable for me. And I thought the real game here is changing the world. So I don't believe in getting another publication out. We can take some of the work we've been doing and slice it and dice it and have enough material for the next 10 years to come. Um, but my goal was, look, there is this big thing happening. A lot of people are making noise about it. But when I go to look at what's out there, um, it just doesn't live up to the vision we could be living up to. So, uh, so I thought it was time, like it was my calling, like there was nothing else I could have done it at that point, then to go out and say, look, you guys are all making a lot of noise, but this is how you actually live up to the, the vision that, that we all are here to, to uphold. Um, so, so it was in, inescapable. It's like going to grad school. When it's time to go to grad school, you just know there is no other option for you. Um, and it's just clear, then you just go do it. And uh, starting a company, I think, is a similar thing. You just have to feel like, okay, well, I'm just so driven to change the world that this is my time and, and place to now, now just go ahead and do it. That's Phenomenal. Well, fantastic. great. Uh, Gun, thanks for taking the time uh, out from the mayhem to, uh, to talk to us about uh, everything you've learned and, and, and forecast for the future. We're, we're rooting for you. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Zach, over to you. Thanks Thank a you lot. so much. Thanks, Gunn.